But then three weeks later, she suffered a second stroke. And all of a sudden, the conversation changed um, to more of a, what does quality of life look like? And what are these wishes? And it hit us right then. A huge light bulb went off in her head um, when the neurologist said to us, does she have an advanced directive? What are her wishes? And we said, okay, she, she was prepared. She had her paperwork. And he, and he said, well, this is good. He said, he, he said to us, and I remember him saying, I, I don't like these documents. And I was surprised because I'm like, my mom was prepared. How do you not like these? He's like, I don't like them in absence of conversation. He's like, did you have to talk about these wishes? And we said, absolutely. Because my mom always talked about what quality of life looked like for her. She did not talk about medical or clinical. And that's what the conversation project's really about. We take the medical clinical out of it. And she really talked about her values and what a good day would look like for her and what would be her worst nightmare um, in terms of, of, of what a life would look like for her. And so basically, uh, what, when the cro- this crossroads came, I had my mom on my shoulder and we had her with us. And we, you know, we did not want to hear about it. We were the typical daughters who were like, ah, mom, don't talk about this. You're not going to die. You're too young. You know, you've got until age 100, right? So we pushed it off, but she, like a good mom, kept pecking away at us and at different times would initiate these conversations with us. Um, And so we knew what mattered to her and we were able to take her values and those conversations and then turn that into the clinical decisions that we then had to make for her. And so um, we were able to make decisions knowing that this is exactly what mom wanted. And all three of us sisters, I've got two other sisters, we're all on the same page. My aunt and my uncles were all on the same page because she had not just talked to her proxy and my sister, she talked to all of us. And so it made her end of life a, a time that we could actually be present with her. We made decisions that we knew that she wanted. Um, and I can tell you that, you know, we always think about the decisions we make. I think everyone would always think about that, but not once have we doubted the decisions because we knew that those were what she wanted. I'm Dr. Regina Kep. I'm a board-certified clinical psychologist, and I specialize with older adults and families. I created the Psychology of Aging podcast to include older adults in conversations about mental health and wellness. And here's why this is important. When we're all a little more informed about mental health for older adults, we reduce suffering and improve quality of life. And who doesn't want that? So join me. It's simple. All you have to do is listen, be willing to learn, and then share what you learn with others so that they can be included in this conversation too. All right, let's get started. Did you know that by 2034, in less than 15 years, there will be more adults, 65 and older, than children under the age of 18? 20% of these older adults will have a mental health concern. And here's the thing. Mental health concerns are highly treatable in older adults. There is a common misconception that depression is a normal part of aging. In fact, depression is not a normal part of aging. Mental health providers need to be skilled and thoughtful around the mental health needs of older adults. And I offer training programs that address just that. There are three main training programs that I offer. One is on mental health care of older adults. It's great for mental health agencies or mental health providers. The next is on sexual health and aging, but not just any sexual health. It's on sexual health in the context of dementia disorders. And what happens in the context of dementia disorders when the person may have diminished capacity to make a decision around sexual interactions. That's great for senior care communities. And finally, on equity and inclusion in senior care. And this is great for mental health or senior care communities. If you'd like to learn more about my training programs, head on over to my website. That's www.dr, for Dr. Regina Kep, K-O-E-P-P dot com. I'll see you there, and I hope that you check out some of the training opportunities. Is there ever a good time to start the conversation about what you want for your own end-of-life care? I mean, 
How do you even start a conversation about end-of-life care? What do you even say? To help us answer these questions, I'm delighted to be interviewing today's guest, Patty Webster. Patty is lead of community engagement for The Conversation Project. The Conversation Project is a public engagement initiative to ensure that everyone's wishes for care through the end of life are both expressed and respected. In this episode, Patty shares lots of information and resources, and you can find all of them in the show notes. There will be a link to the show notes wherever you're listening to this podcast in the details of the podcast. Without further delay, let's jump into this episode with Patty Webster. So Patty Webster, thank you so much for joining me on the Psychology of Aging podcast. Can you share a little bit about who you are and your role on the Conversation Project? Sure. And first and foremost, thank you so much for having me and and having me represent the Conversation Project. Um, We're excited to share and learn alongside of you. And and so my role is um, I lead the community engagement side of our work at the Conversation Project, which means that I have a fantastic uh, role of really listening and learning to so many community members, whether it is a retired nurse um, or it is a community member who wants to bring us to the book club um, or an area agency uh, for aging uh, that's looking to expand and help. So we we have communities all over, uh, groups all over doing this. And so we try to help help communities spread the word um, in addition to what we do for, for the general public at the Conversation Project is really help people talk about their wishes and what really matters to them when it comes to the care that they want through the end of life. How did the Conversation Project get started? So um, it started with Ellen Goodman, who founded the Conversation Project, um, along with some some colleagues and friends of hers. Um, Ellen is a Pulitzer Prize um, winning journalist. I don't know if you know Ellen. Um, She wrote for the Boston Globe and um, she and her mom had a really close relationship and talked about everything. Um, But she talks about how she talked about everything except one thing. And that's how her mom wanted to live through the end of her life. Um, And so Ellen's mom had suffered dementia. And so as as her condition um, started to get worse, they started asking Ellen about care decisions. And she had, they started asking questions that she just was blindsided uh, about how to answer because she had never talked to her mom about what kind of care she may or may not want or what quality of life looked like for her through the end of life. So she had a tough decisions to make and she wished she had had her mom on her shoulder, she says, giving her guidance. And so um, after going through that experience, she started talking with colleagues and and friends um, and sharing stories about um, different people who had died in their lives. And the common denominator for those that had what she called a difficult end of life was that they hadn't had those conversations um, before the medical crisis happened. Um, And so she decided she really wanted to to start up a grassroots movement to help people and normalize talking about death and and end of life. But it's more, it's, it's not talking about death. It's really talking about how you want to live through that end of life. Um, And so she started the conversation project to get people talking. Um, It started with public engagement um, through social media, news articles, traditional media, um, and also to get something in people's hands. Um, And so we developed a starter kit and a series of starter kits. So we have a lot of free resources for folks to to get something in their hands and Ellen jokes just to jumpstart that conversation because half the battle is just starting. And so it helps people think about their values and and what they want. Um, And um, she's combined that as she started this group, she combined that with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Um, And so the Conversation Project is a project now of IHI, um, which is the the acronym, um, because IHI is known for improving care and health worldwide. um, And they have a mission of trying to, to reach broadly um, and collaborate and connect people together. And so Ellen knew that by joining forces with IHI, she could spread this um, even further um, and really help uh, be part of a a whole host of organizations that are doing really fantastic things um, to normalize conversations about care wishes. Um, And so that's kind of how she started and how, um, how it merged with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Patty, can you talk about some of the emotional benefits to having these end-of-life conversations or starting these end-of-life conversations? 
Yeah. Um, and I can, I, I'll share a little story personally, but let me start with, um, so the, in the conversation project, we've done a couple national surveys at different points of time. Um, one of the, the barriers people say is that they're worried that it, to upset their loved ones or, or those that matter to them in their life to have this conversation. But in the survey, the latest survey we did in 2018, 53% say they actually felt relief that this was brought up by somebody. Um, and 95% of those that we surveyed, so national sample of Americans, and, and across all boards, culture, race, ethnicity, 95% they want to or are willing to have these conversations. Um, so we know that this is something that people want. When they have these conversations, we also know that uh, it really helps to bring, um, it, it potentially brings it, it, the experience of someone after someone has died that was less complicated or less complex grief. Um, and so we know that depression rates drop when conversations do happen ahead of time before a health crisis. And so I, I, sh I say that I know this personally is I went through um, end of life unexpectedly with my own mom. Um, she died at age 73. And, and to us, that was really young. Um, my grandmother um, was 106 when she died. So she lived um, pretty late. Um, my grandfather was, was 94 when he died. Um, so we have longevity in my family. So uh, to me, my whole, my whole, um, my aging is skewed because I think, you know, I think the hundred, that's, that's what you're shooting for. So um, when my mom um, suffered her first stroke at age 73, it was, it was out of the blue, which stroke is, um, but she had no health risk factor. She was extremely healthy. She had just come back from a trip. Um, she was enjoying retirement. There was really no risk factors. They couldn't figure out why she had that stroke. Um, and she literally lost her voice. And so she had uh, suffered from a condition called aphasia where you, you, she couldn't speak up for herself. So um, my mom, though, had been a real big proponent of being prepared um, and planning for things that are, might be unexpected. And so she had a healthcare proxy. My sister was her proxy and um, I was her backup. Um, and uh, she had made her wishes known. And at this point, it was not end-of-life wishes. These were, we were making decisions for her for full recovery because that's what was anticipated. Um, but then three weeks later, she suffered a second stroke, and all of a sudden, the conversation changed um, to more of a what does quality of life look like and what are these wishes? And it hit us right then. A huge light bulb went off in her head uh, when the neurologist said to us, does she have an advanced directive? What are her wishes? And we said, okay, she, she was prepared. She had her paperwork. And he, and he said, well, this is good. He said, he, he said to us, and I remember him saying, I, I don't like these documents. And I was surprised because I'm like, my mom is prepared. How do you not like these? He's like, I don't like them in absence of conversation. He's like, did you happen to talk about these wishes? And we said, absolutely. Because my mom always talked about what quality of life looked like for her. She did not talk about medical or clinical, and that's what the conversation project's really about. We take the medical clinical out of it, and she really talked about her values and what a good day would look like for her and what would be her worst nightmare um, in terms of, of, of what a life would look like for her. And so uh, it's, uh, I'm telling you too long of a story, but basically uh, what, when the cro this crossroads came, I had my mom on my shoulder, and we had her with us, and we you know, we did not want to hear about it. We were the typical daughters who were like, ah, mom, don't talk about this. You're not going to die. You're too young. You know, you've got until age 100, right? So we pushed it off, but she, like a good mom, kept pecking away at us and at different times would initiate these conversations with us. Um, and so we knew what mattered to her and we were able to take her values and those conversations and then turn that into the clinical decisions that we then had to make for her. And so um, we were able to make decisions knowing that this is exactly what mom wanted. And all three of us sisters, I've got two other sisters, were all on the same page. My aunt and my uncles were all on the same page because she had not just talked to her proxy and my sister, she talked to all of us. And so it made her end of life a, a time that we could actually be present with her. We made decisions that we knew that she wanted. Um, and I can tell you that, you know, we always think about the decisions we make. I think everyone would always think about that, but not once have we doubted the decisions because we knew that those were what she wanted. Um, and 
it's still surreal. This is four years ago, um, but it still feels like yesterday. But, you know, we, I didn't go through a period of angst or doubt or depression because of questioning the decisions we made. Um, I'm, I'm sad and we're still deeply, um, it's still very deep and there's a huge hole. Um, but, sure. but I, I um, just that personal story, and, and there's so many that we hear from families, that the emotional, that, that is, you're able to free somebody up to really focus on, um, on them and caring for them at the end of their life. Um, and so, you know, when things are really out of your control, this is a way to do to help prepare ourselves and those we care about and really bring a sense of purpose um, to someone's end of life. On a sense of Sorry, peace. That was a lot. <laughs> oh, that was a beautiful and important story. Thank you. I, I don't think it's too long at all. I think end of life stories need to be the length that they are. And I just value so many things about what you shared. One is that your mom g- gave you a compass. Mm-hmm. It wasn't that if there's this pr- uh, procedure on the table, then you make this decision because she can't possibly know every scenario at the end of life but she gave you her set of values and a compass to kind of guide you in making all of these decisions. And then it resulted, it sounds like in a sense of peace for you and your family and a sense of knowing that you honored her based on the compass that she kind of set out for you Absolutely. and herself. And, and that you, you hit it spot on. And that's really what the conversation project and our tools really emphasize is that you can never prepare for every clinical scenario. It's impossible. You would drive yourself crazy trying to do that. Um, Now with COVID-19, it's a different, you know, all of a sudden there is a scenario in front of us, but you can't prepare. But what she did is exactly that. She gave us the roots and knowing what really, uh, what mattered to her was such a huge help to us. And that's what part of our tools are really are to take out the clinical and talk about what matters to you, not what's the matter with you. Not that those are the clinical conversations that, that need to happen. Um, but these value-based conversations inform that. Um, and it is, it was so helpful for us. Um, and that's part of the reason why I'm so passionate about this is because we had this experience. I want everyone to have that experience and not everyone will have that experience. Sure. Uh, but if people can start talking about it now, um, and really have the ability to have a trusted decision maker. And a lot of people don't have trust in the healthcare system, rightfully so. There has been a lot of wrongs to many, many groups. Yeah. Um, but if you are able to speak to someone and have an advocate on your side, it helps break some of those, some of those barriers. Oh, th- well, thank you, Patty, for sharing your very personal story. I really admire your mom and her courage. It's a scary thing to have end of life conversations. It takes courage. And what you're sharing is that it results in reduced depression, increased quality of life and increased sense of peace for all the family members who are um, informed about what the person who's at the end of life is, is wanting for their quality of life. Uh, And other research, in addition to what you shared, other research shows that there's less depression and anxiety. So there is there are multiple sources of research that are leading to the same results that when people have end of life conversations, they want to have them. And then there are emotional benefits for having them with reduced depression and anxiety and increased quality of life. Thank you for, I'm so excited to get my hands on your research. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and we, we didn't do the research on the depression rates that came from other studies, probably the ones that you're, you're talking about. Um, But we've done the research on kind of on who's having conversations and uh, what does that bring? But there's some really good studies out there, um, and people are, are still looking into that and on what what effects this has. Um, it also we've seen from stories that we've heard. We, we collect a lot of stories, um, so a lot of that qualitative um, and 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 not kind of the soft data. But really, it's so important on how this really helps build can help build better relationships between family members or between circles of friends when you talk about this before a health crisis happens. Not, not all. Some families are, have, have challenges, but what we have heard is that as you start talking about this, um, it really helps to bring people together. We have a, um, a wonderful community who's in the Boston area, Bethel AME Church, 
Um, and uh, pastors uh, Gloria White Hammond uh, and Reverend Sabrina Gray lead uh, conversations within their congregation. Uh, and Pastor Gloria said something once to us that's, that really hit home. She said, this is the healing balm. It's B-A-L-M. So it's a healing balm. And they see how as we start talking about these conversations, it's healing rifts um, in some of the families that aren't talking. And this might be a way to help start sharing because a lot of this, this sharing is stories. So talking about what's happened in the past or uh, what happened to grandma or you know what, what happened with Uncle Joe. Um, and it starts people thinking and really talking about their values and, and their faith that faith and your culture, your family, those all influence your decisions. Um, and those conversations really are, are helping to bring about um, better relationships uh, with families and even better relationships between individuals and, and the healthcare system, which is, which is critically needed. Yes. You're saying from the patient to the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. You know, um, we, we have some of our work, we do work in the community. And so we help individuals with tools um, and really start thinking about what matters to them. And then we have a whole part of our work that is uh, we call conversation ready, where we're helping um, healthcare institutions become conversation ready uh, and focus on the principles of how do we help respect those wishes and so it's, it was so important to the conversation project when we started, if we're going to help um, provide support for people to talk about this in communities, well, we need to provide support and make sure that those wishes are respected because we don't want to create further harm um, and inequities in care because we know, especially with COVID-19, the, the inequities that have been around for years, especially um, for our Black community, um, in healthcare, that that's been happening. COVID has has brought that and kind of reared its head, um, and to all um, communities of color. Um, and and we know that there is a disparity in care. What we don't want is further disparities. When if you're only reaching certain groups, or we're having conversations in communities, but we're not talking about how do we respect that. And so um, some of the work we do is really focusing on our connect principle, is ensuring that we are first connecting and understanding um, other people's faiths and cultures, we bringing a sense of cultural humility to this work. And so we say we, we, we aren't going to be able to be competent in every other, every other person's culture, background, and beliefs, but we certainly can be um, gentle and we can listen and we can recognize our own biases that we bring to this um, and approach this with humility and really understand that People are going to have different values um, and wishes based on faith and, and race and gender um, and ethnicity and abilities. And so um, part of our work is really helping to make sure that we're connecting first and listening and understanding um, the, the differences that people bring and creating trust. Um, because as I mentioned before, that mistrust um, and, and abuse that the healthcare system has had on certain populations has, has, is real um, and so first, uh, if this is a way to help people communicate and have conversations, we hope that will help. Um, and then some of our other principles then are next is really, we, we really encourage healthcare providers to walk the talk um, and do this themselves. And so if you haven't actually had these conversations and thought about what you want, what really matters to you and what are your values and what kind of care you may want now and through the end of life. If you haven't had those conversations, how are you supposed to do that with other people? So we really say you, you have to do this first and foremost um, before you help others do that. And our team does that as well. Thank you for talking about the cultural humility that is needed and essential when doing any sort of work with others. And especially at end of life care, I really, that, that's a strong value of mine. And I really admire that with the work that you're doing too. Can you talk a little bit about some of the tools that you all are? Um, I, I mean, I looked at your website. You have so many free tools for families. Um, too so many, have, too many. Well, and, and such important ones. There's the starter kit. There are tools for um, families with dementia. There are tools for families with children who are end of life. Um, can you, and I, since this is the psychology of aging, could you um, talk about some of the tools for older adults and older families? Absolutely. So our starter kits are our flagship tools, um, our starter conversation guide. And so we are actually in the process of refreshing these guides to make sure that they're inclusive um, and they are reaching 
all the different types of groups that can be reached. So um, we will have some new ones out um, at the end of the year. So just stay tuned for, for that. Um, but our, our starter kits and, and those, those guides to have conversations really are geared towards, as, as I mentioned before, taking the clinical and medical out of that um, and focusing on values. So our flagship kit is really for anybody. Anybody over 18 um, should be having these conversations, especially as you age and as your, your health condition changes. Um, we are encouraging these for older adults, um, but we, we do encourage this at the beginning because we know, and, and with COVID happening, we know that something can happen at, at any, any moment. Um, but so we have a kit that helps you think about your values. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's shifting that what's the matter with you to the, what matters to you. Um, and that's rooted and helps you think about, well, how do my beliefs or my faith and spirituality, my family, familiar or cultural background, how does that influence um, what kind of care I may or may not want um, when it comes to decisions through the end of life? And so the kits walk you through questions and they're really meant to be like pen on paper or typing and really active. So you can do this online. Um, if, you're, don't, if you're not online and can print that out, everything's free, so you can print it out. Um, and basically, the kits that we have are to help people think first, think about what is it that they, that they may want. And it gives an opportunity to be introspective and reflective and thinking about what matters. And so in those kits, we have scale, what we call our scale questions. Um, but basically, it, it is, uh, it, there are questions to prompt you and where might you fall? And there's no right or wrong. It's a sliding scale. And it might change throughout um, as, you, as your wishes and your ideas change and your health changes. Um, and it talks about the role that you would want to play in your own care. It talks about um, the decisions that you might want for your own health care and then what role you want others to play in this, that care. Um, and so our kits are similar in that they, they, each of them has these, um, these, these scale questions and open-ended questions to talk about your values. Um, the, one of the kits that's really poignant, especially for those that are older age or those that might be um, family members or friends that have um, people that matter in their life that have either Alzheimer's disease or dementia, we have a kit um, that helps people and guides people through that, whether um, the person that you care about or care for is at the beginning stages uh, of a dementia diagnosis, middle or end, or end stage. Um, those kits are designed to really help you think about and put that person at the center and think about what really matters to mom. Um, if your mom is the one that has, has to mention, and if they are unable to speak for themselves, really focusing on what matters to, to her and, and the decisions that she made previously, how can we pull and really enact what her values were based on how she's acted her entire life? And so those kits really help you think and kind of get away from your own space and think about how can we be an advocate for someone who might not be able to speak up for themselves. Um, and those kits really focus on quality of life and it really, are, they're active in making a plan. So we first have you think about it. We have you then make a plan. And so who are you going to talk with? When might that be? Where might be comfortable for them and you? So it's not just about you. Um, I, I joke that I tried to have this conversation with my 18-year-old son, um, and I started at the dinner table. That is where we talk as a family. The dinner table is kind of where we have all the conversations. And so as we started this conversation, he was going off to college. The minute I started, he pulled his chair away, and he said, okay, I'm done with dinner, and he beelined it at the stairs. And I was like, okay, this is clearly not the place to have a conversation. And so we, we shifted, and we recognized, okay, where for him is comfortable for him? Um, or where might he not be able to take that chair away? So on the six-hour drive to school, we had a conversation in the car. <laughs> so so we in those kits, we, we help you make a plan for how to best approach this. And then we give you some uh, starter suggestions. How do you start this? Because oftentimes that's the one part. Okay, I know what I want to say. I know what matters to me. How do I even go there? And so we offer some tips and some conversation starters. Um, and then we send you on your way to say, okay, now you've got something to talk about. We've got some openers. Go ahead and, and start these conversations. Um, and I say conversations, and we joke that we should have been named the Conversations Project because it's not a one and done deal. There are, these are ongoing conversations that need to happen. And uh, don't force it. It's gonna, it might take a while. And I know with my dad, it actually took a couple tries. Um, so we offer some guidance on that. 
when you were talking with your son, were you sharing with him your end of life values or were you asking him about his? So we started with sharing ours because we wanted him to know, we thought, okay, it's an easy entree to say, here's what we want, or we thought it was, here's what we want. Um, and we had to retool that because that, he didn't want to hear about that. So we, we, re, we switched that because he was going to college. And, and some people don't realize that when you're 18, your parents are no longer your automatic healthcare decision makers. Um, I think it's in 43 states. They will decide who your decision maker is. Um, but so it, we urge people at age 18 to, to designate a healthcare proxy. So we shifted that to say, okay, now you're 18, something should happen to you. Who do you want to speak for yourself? And that is a much easier entry for a lot of people, even older adults, is if you can't speak on your own behalf, who do you want? Who do you trust? Um, we want to make sure that you have a voice. And so that is a really good way to start. And so that's how we, when we retooled it, how we started with our, with our son. And as then we started talking about his proxy, we said, okay, well, if I'm going to enact a decision based on, on what you want, tell me a little bit about what that looks like. And so that was an easier way for him to start. Um, we gave some examples and he much preferred that. He said, okay, here are the statements that I am closer to at this moment. Um, and so you have to really think about what's going to resonate. Um, and we, we hear stories from, from folks, what does really resonate with one is not going to resonate with somebody else. Um, so, you, so we help people think about what, what is that, what is it that going to look like for your own family or for those that really matter to you? I also appreciate that it's a living, breathing conversation that it's over time. And as you mentioned, as your health status changes, you might also want to change your, uh, what, what you originally thought in terms of your end of life care. I work with a lot of older adults who are at end of life or have significant medical illness and they'll say, well, Dr. Kep, if I'm ever in a wheelchair, I don't want to live. And then they end up in a wheelchair. And then they'll say, okay, well, this isn't so bad. This isn't as bad as I thought. If I'm ever incontinent, then I, I don't think I'll have much quality of life. Then they experience incontinence. And then they'll say, okay, well, this isn't so bad. I can modify yeah. and I'm, I've adjusted. And so I think people have a vision of how life will be. And I appreciate that it seems that Conversation Project acknowledges and respects that people's journey in their health or in their end of life is unfamiliar and, and that it can change, what your wishes are can change. And it, it seems like there's room for these changes in, in the tools that you offer, which is really cool. Absolutely. And we, you know, we encourage that and we want people to know that course, your wishes are going to change. Some people, they don't, and that's okay, whatever that may be, but know that you can absolutely change your, your wishes and you can also change your proxy. So um, that happens often too. So whether you go through a divorce um, or you, you recognize that someone may not be the right voice for you, um, sometimes people think they have to choose their partner, but they, that might not be the person because they may not have, um, they may not want to have that role. They may want to be more at your side and not making those decisions. And so in our kits, uh, we want to make sure and in, in the work that we do that people know that they can adjust and they can change. Um, and we really, it, it, we talk about at different stages of life. So um, when you turn 20, when you're 30, 40, um, if you have a serious illness, if you are um, going on a major trip, your wishes may change. Um, Kate DeBartolo, who, who leads our, our work, shares a story that her, she's had many conversations with her family. Um, her father has shared his wishes. Um, often they, they talk about this. He was planning on going on, on a cross-country motorcycle trip. Um, and they sat down before this trip and he said, okay, I know what I've shared before, but let me, let me change a little bit. If I should get into an accident and you and I'm on life support, and previously he said he didn't want to be on life support, he said, if you want to come and say goodbye to me, since I'm not, you're, you won't be there, that's okay. You, you don't have to, you know, this, this supersedes that previous wish. So it is okay. And people do this all the time to say, I want to be here for my granddaughter's wedding. Um, and so it is really important as, especially as a healthcare proxy, when you're going to, if you are going to help advocate for someone, if they can't speak up for themselves, 
to revisit that conversation um, in at various stages to make sure you know and, and see when that person's wishes um, and they have been changed and you can adapt uh, the way that you, you respond to that person. Yeah. Now these documents are, uh, they're conversation facilitators. Do you also offer advanced directives, the legal document itself, or are they, none of these are legal documents They're Is that right? Or yeah, that's right. So ours, we, our niche is really starting that conversation. Um, and there are other groups who are fabulous with the documentation and the legal forms. We don't go um, that route because that is just not our expertise. Uh, but we, we definitely recommend that once you have that conversation, you then look to the groups that have the advanced directives and document that. Uh, we are really big on talking about it and, and having it known because if you have the document without that conversation and that, you know, that's exactly what that doctor said to me, it's it, end of life is very nuanced. The decisions aren't cut and dry. Um, people say, you know, I want the whole enchilada or pull the plug. Well, there's not often a plug to pull or what is the whole enchilada? What does that mean to you? And so um, we really focus first on those conversations. The documents we have are to jumpstart. It doesn't contain everything that you need to talk about, but it gives you an idea of how to get this going. And that's really all you need to start these conversations because they, once you start, things will, will, will come up with your family members. And so we focus on how to get people started. Um, there are some great groups that do documentation. There's Prepare for Your Care that does advanced directives. Um, the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization has a, a fantastic site that has advanced directives for every single state. Um, there's different groups out there. There's Five Wishes that has a document um, that can serve as an advanced directive. There's a lot of different resources out there. Uh, we try to point people when we can um, to those documents, uh, but we, we, we stay out of the lane of the, the legal area. Why well, really, uh, they're all important. Having the conversation is important. Having legal documents are important. I think they're, they're com- um, what is it? complimentary, right? They, they, yes. you, in order to have a, a legal document that really addresses your value and your wish, you need to have thought it through and shared it with your family. Also, legal documents um, are just that. They, they are a document and they offer legal um, protection, but they don't offer conversation. Yeah. And there are lots of interpretations about what that legal document even means when you're in the middle of having, um, having to make decisions as a proxy. Yeah. And, and, and if that legal document is filed away somewhere in a safety deposit box and no one has access to it, it's, it's challenging if you don't have access to the document itself. But it is, in, from my own personal experience, if we hadn't had those conversations with my mom, it would have been extremely difficult um, based on her complexity at her end of life. And so I can't understate how important those conversations were in addition to, to having those wishes. And, and as, you, as you mentioned, a legal document, sometimes that has to be enacted because different family members um, may have different wishes for, for someone that they are caring for. So it is important um, to have something that in writing to clear that up. But it's also, we, we really emphasize if you're going to pick one person to be your healthcare decision maker, make sure others that might have a say in your care know that. Um, and especially if families are, are not as close, um, you know, we were all on the same page. My family was very lucky. Not a lot of families are, but it is really important to say, okay, Joe is my medical decision maker. He knows, now you know. Um, and, and talk with them um, if you can about, at, at least tell them that they're the decision maker. We have um, a, a couple that was at one of our workshops that um, the, it was a remarried couple. So the husband had um, picked his new, new wife to be his healthcare proxy, but he hadn't told his adult children. Um, and so we encourage, let them know that, that she is the proxy because you don't want any stickiness, especially um, when the time comes, because you want that to be more of a uh, of a time when people can can get along versus fighting over um, over wishes. Yeah, especially with um, couples who join together later in life, I see a lot of dissension among adult children and the new spouse, and there is just a. Lot of, sometimes there can be um, misinformation. Um, miscommunications, lack of communication, 
really appreciate your recommendation. I was going to say, we, we talk about this scenario we call the seagull effect when um, there's kids that are at the parent side, uh, or it may not be a nuclear family like that, um, but know the, the mother's wishes. But then the brother from California comes swooping in to say, okay, I'm going to, I know exactly what to do. And like a seagull kind of drops all over the place and everything is up in arms. So we really say, okay, if you have someone close to you here, and you don't have to be a proxy, you don't have to be within close proximity, but make sure that son or that sibling or someone who's farther away knows the wishes um, before coming in and changing everything around. Um, so we're trying to avoid that seagull effect. Yeah, I, that is messy. <laughs> <laughs> it's droppings and feathers and... <laughs> Oh, the kicked up sand. Oh, that's right. Um, okay, so now what are some of the top recommendations you have for helping families get started? You shared some already. So in your starter kits, you actually have scripts, it sounds like, for what to say. Yeah. And does for your son, it was, does this fit more to where you're at right now or this? What, what are some of the recommendations you have for families getting started in these conversations? So really, as I, I was saying before, really first start from a place of love. So these conversations are not all gloom and doom. Um, it really is how you want to live and, and what you value and what quality looks like to you. So don't think that it has to be such a heavy conversation. Um, we often say tap into love and laughter. It's okay that, that, um, to have fun with these conversations. Um, we, we have videos that we have to, to kind of lighten up. Um, and make not make light of death. We never want to make light of death, but we want to make the conversation lighter and more accessible. Um, so we have videos that you can use um, to, to kind of get the point, a, a, you know, hit, hit the point home in a way that people are just like, oh, I, I can, I can do this. Um, there's also games that you can play, um, and so we don't have games, but there's some great groups that have games out there. I'm, I'm talking about this, um, but if that is not in your wheelhouse and in your family's wheelhouse, don't go that route. So really focus on something that resonates with your people. Um, and so it might be a newspaper article. Uh, my in-laws, when COVID-19 first hit, um, the Conversation Project came up with a being prepared uh, in COVID-19 times, a, a kind of a two-page guide on how to be prepared right now, um, how to pick a person if you can't speak for yourself, talk with them and make a plan. And so with that guide, um, there was a great article that came out and it was talking about um, the use of ventilators. And my in-laws are really big at um, reading all the information and getting everything that they can about what was going on. So we paired an article. We knew that article would, would be of interest to them. And so we said, you know, here's, we just saw this, this really good article um, and we have a guide to talk about that. Let us know what you think. And so we paired that together and that really worked with them. Um, I mentioned my dad, he does not, like to talk about this at all. He went through some really hard experiences as a kid. He's had a lot of loss in his life early on. Um, and because of those experiences, it's really hard for him to talk about this. And so for my dad, the, the approach um, was really tapping into stories and, and talking about his brother, Jimmy, who died when he was younger, but really talking about Jimmy and, and, and tapping into some of those stories. Um, and really the opening for him was, dad, can you help me with something? And my dad, and like probably most dads, who's going to refuse helping their daughter? Um, and so I said, okay, what, what can I do? And so thinking about what's going to resonate, um, we had a, a great um, jur um, journalist and, and author, Katie Butler, write a blog for us about her experience that she went through with her father who had dementia. She wrote a letter. Uh, if she were to have dementia, based on her experience with her dad, here's what I would want. So for some people, a letter really resonates, getting it on paper and sharing that. Um, and so you have to tap into what really is going to work with your family members based on their experiences, um, based on their culture as well. Um, and there are some, there's a great group, uh, the Chinese American Coalition for Compassionate Care based out in California. They developed a card game um, based on another game, this Go Wish card game that's out there but they developed heart-to-heart -heart cards um, that are in English and, and Chinese. And um, they developed this knowing that the Chinese community really is big on cards. And that is an opener for them is, is through the use of cards. Um, so you have to really think about what's, what's going to resonate um, with the person in front of you. 
Um, the kits are, you know, take a look at those kits. It's a great way to get your thoughts together. Um, so take a look at that and, and really start thinking about what you would want. And that can help um, open up the door and say, hey, I was just listening to a podcast and I really thought about what, what care wishes I want, but I realize I don't know yours. Can you tell me a little bit? So use, you know, use something like this to actually open up that conversation. Um, and we always, uh, one of the big things that, that Ellen says, and we, we really emphasize this, we say it's always too soon or it always seems too soon until it's too late. Um, so starting these conversations now, and I think because of COVID, people actually really understand that, you know, something can happen uh, to any of us at any moment. And so really starting now and really thinking of, and talking about your family, we really want people to think about doing it before a healthcare episode happens. Um, there was a, a, a gentleman who shared a great analogy with me. He said, you wouldn't talk about driving drunk at a DUI checkpoint. That is not the time to start that conversation. Just like you wouldn't start talking about your wishes for care in the ICU. Um, so I really like that analogy. Yes. Oh, thank you so much. This is just wonderful. You've given us so many resources. So I will link to all of the resources that you were describing to the conversation project, to the Chinese American or Chinese Coalition for Compassionate Care. Is that what? Chinese American Coalition for Compassionate Care. Excellent. So I'll <laughs> link to that and to some of the advanced directive resources that you described as well, especially the um, palliative care advanced directives in every state. Oh yeah. Um, if you want to me that. to send, I can send you some links if that's helpful. Oh, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Um, the priority, of course, will be on conversation project and then um, just some of these other. I really appreciate your including with conversation projects goal to be inclusive. I really also appreciate that you're including some in, um, some cultural uh, resources. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot a lot of ones out there that are really important because we we really want to make sure that we are not creating that further inequities in care. Um, and really helping people to think about who am I not reaching? Um, how can I help? How can I listen? Um, and, and that's part of the conversation too, I would say to, to people is really, it's not all about talking. Um, it really is about listening and listening to what matters uh, to the person in front of you. And perspective taking. So there's active listening in the moment when you're having these conversations and then perspective taking later when the person's no longer able to speak for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Okay, so that's how families can start the conversation. And what about professionals? So you were mentioning earlier how important it is for professionals to walk the talk and do the yes. work first. So what other recommendations would you have for professionals? So aside from doing that, first and foremost, you know, get your own eggs in your basket, as we say. Um, I think that the biggest one really is recognizing and that connect principle I was talking about, really recognizing that everyone's different wishes are going to be different and that's okay, and that's going to be based on their own faith, spirituality, culture, gender, experiences, um, and experiences good and bad um, with the healthcare system, but also in, in life in general. And so um, we really, really emphasize that connect principle and really understanding and, and coming to it with a lens of cultural humility um, and recognizing that we do come to this with our own biases um, and opening up and really listening to what someone in front of us is saying um, and being there to help support how we can respect those wishes um, by really listening to them and, and that connect principles. Um, you know, we need conversations and connection more than ever right now. Um, and really it's building those bridges because trust and developing those relationships in, in any part of healthcare, um, especially end of life care, but really all throughout healthcare those relationships really matter. Um, and so when you can recognize that you don't know the person in front of you and can make that relationship happen first, that connect principle is really, really helpful. Um, so I would say that's kind of the, one of the biggest ones. It, aside from doing this themselves and really, um, we've got some great stories of clinicians that uh, young and older that are right now, um, there's a, an ICU nurse that just wrote a beautiful story and blog for us. Um, 27 year old, 27 years old, uh, in the ICU, seeing what's going on right now, saw the need for herself um, at her age to use the kit, make an advanced directive for herself, share those wishes um, with her healthcare proxy and make sure she had a proxy. 
um, recognizing that I have to do this and recognizing that that is a way to then know that it's not easy to, to start these conversations. And so as you do that, recognizing that, okay, I, I can help support someone now that I've gone through this myself. Um, and there's been some other really good articles about emergency room doctors walking the talk as well. Oh, well, I'll link to that. That blog is on your website as well. Um, yeah, so the, the ICU nurse blog is not yet up, but there's, um, there's another one about a hospital chaplain, um, really phenomenal uh, oh, story and that. background that she brings. Yeah. Was that uh, and so this, about her dad? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that was beautiful. I read that earlier. Oh, it's, I'll link to that too. It was beautiful. And then, so the ICU nurse will be um, one of our next stories coming up. We have actually a, a series of blogs. We've had some really incredible um, insights and stories from folks um, that are really just opening up on what, what end of life and what life, what matters to them um, and based on their own beliefs and backgrounds. And it's been really humbling and exciting to, to hear some of these stories. And so we're, we're going to be sharing these stories across the year. Well, so profound and important right now, especially the healthcare worker stories during COVID. I, um, right when COVID started at the hospital, at the Atlanta VA healthcare system that I work in, I led a support group for uh, medical interns and residents who were in the ICU. Um, yeah, yeah. And it was so, you know, there was a lot of fear in the beginning and not knowing exactly um, transmittability and is it airborne? Is it not? Is it just uh, passing through touching and liquids? It was, it was so confusing. These young residents and interns had, you know, children and families and trying to figure out how to um, care for sick patients in the ICU and also care for their own families and themselves and just um, the bind that healthcare professionals who are on um, direct care lines are in often with, uh, I just really admire the courage of the ICU nurse who was talking about getting her um, conversations started and yeah. documents completed. It takes a lot of courage to do that when you are facing um, these, this health crisis in, in the face, when you're eye to eye with it, it's terrifying. And yeah. so I just, my my admiration goes out to her. My re respect goes out to her. Uh, and I can't even imagine. And, you know, on the flip side, we talk about what, what can professionals do? And also for, for people, we, we just need to understand that, that all of these healthcare providers that are putting their lines on the, lives on the line are human beings. Um, and that's, you know, respecting and, and they're, they're doing so much um, for, for all of us. Um, and they're going through this as well. And so I think that's one of the things too, is, is making sure we're connecting and understanding where they're coming from as well. Mm -hmm. And their families. I mean, just, the, yeah. Oh, in the beginning, um, uh, care worker residents and interns would share with me that they would, you know, not be seeing their children for weeks because they were rotating in the ICU and with, with, yeah. um, folks with COVID. So then they were quarantining themselves away from their little children, like toddlers, because they wouldn't want to expose them. It's just all the sacrifices that so many people are making from direct care in the hospitals to um, grocery workers are oh, yeah. essential workers as well right now and exposing themselves to so many people. Yeah. Yep. So um, I just mad respect for all the people out there who are sacrificing their. Totally their agree. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. Well, I really just want to thank you so much for your time and all of these really valuable resources and starting the conversation with me so that we can extend the conversation to families and professionals and hopefully um, create, you know, culturally humble compasses and knowledge of what, where people's values are in their own end of life journey and their quality of lives and, and the, and respecting where people are at encouraging these conversations. It's so important. I really appreciate your being here and giving us an incredible amount of resources to get started. Well, thank you so much for having, having me. And I love the way that you put this and, and tie this together with your, your, um, the compass. And I, you know, I just love the work that you're doing. And the more we can talk about this together and with others, um, the better that, that we can continue to spread the word. And I'm just really grateful for, for you having me here. That's all for today. Now it's your turn. 
Join the movement to include older adults in conversations about mental health and wellness. It's simple. All you have to do is subscribe, leave a review, and share this episode with others so that they can be part of the conversation too. One last thing, a special thanks to Jasmine Joyner, our Psychology of Aging podcast intern, for all you do. Lots of love to you and your family. Bye for now. Lena, do you think aging is scary? No. No? Why not? Because it makes us happy. Aging makes us happy? Yeah, I'm going to be bigger and taller.